Welcome to Acting Smarter Now podcast, where I help actors with their tools and materials to take their careers to new heights. Today is a very special episode. We lost a giant in the comedy world recently, a gentleman by the name of Rudy Moreno. Rudy was a staple in the comedy community for over 30 some years. Um, he was a dear friend. I loved him so much. He was a great supporter of all comics. And I wanted to share with you the last interview I did with him. Um, so you could see what a great guy he was and take away some of the wisdom that he shares. Without further ado, let's go to the interview. Please help me welcome comedian, uh, musician, MC extraordinaire, Mr. Rudy Moreno. Every time I talk about you, I let everybody know what a pleasure it is to know you. Oh, thank you. Because um, I've known you, wow, over 25 years at least. And um, you were the first comic that I met that was kind to me. Really? Well, as a girl doing stand-up comedy at that time, you know, guys were like, uh, you're not supposed to be here. You know, you shouldn't be doing right. this, blah, blah, blah. And so I was used to that. I was not used to a fellow comic embracing me and saying, that was good. You did good. And and had no, um, there was no hidden agenda. Right. There were, you weren't trying to get anything. You right. were just being kind. And um, we don't, we need more of that. We need more of that. And, well, thank you. Thank and you. how you, um, when you started uh, running your your comedy rooms, how you were always and have been always so generous with comics. Just there's always a lot of love in your rooms. The the uh, audiences are always great. Um, you don't get crazy people, you know, and that's a testament to who you are, you know. So I, I just wanted to say that because you really have done a lot for Latino comedy in Los Angeles. Thank you. Just. Thank you straight out i mean you've been consistent you you have nurtured a lot of uh com- young latino comedians coming up and you've never asked for anything and so um i just want to say thank you and uh one other thing you have those christmas toy drives that right. you do every yeah. year and you make the comics bring something that's right i love I, that yeah yeah it's been a lot of so, fun it's been great thank you for all that it's very nice of you um yeah, no, I've had a really good time, and I mean, I, I, I'm glad I got to meet you, and I mean, you've helped me out a lot with my career, too. I mean, you were giving me some suggestions and stuff, and uh, I thought when I started, there was only a couple of other Latino comics, and then I went with uh, Gilbert Esquivel, took me to the comedy store, and there was like 900 other Latino <laughs> comics. There, you know? and, I was like, and then there was female Latino comics, too, so, you know, this was, this was something because I had worked in an area just where there was just a couple of guys. I thought it was just me. Paul Rodriguez, George, and I met Gilbert. I go, okay, now there's four of us. And I got over there, man, and it, it looked like a wedding. First of all, where are you from? I'm from Lincoln Heights. Well, actually, Lincoln Heights is northeast of East, East LA. It's by Dodger Stadium. Okay. It's a small little community. And I now live in Monterey Park, which is not that far from Lincoln Heights, but, you know, I say I moved out of town. Um, and I've, you know, I've been there my entire life. And what made you want to start doing comedy? Well, you know, I didn't, I was always funny as a kid. And uh, I was a class clown as usual, you know, most, most comics are. And uh, I was working at the gas company. And I was working in the field, and so I hurt my back. And a, f- a friend of mine who was a musician, they had a band called Tierra. Yes, and, very uh, big band. Yeah, they had a big hit. Mm-hmm. And so he tells me, because he was from the same area, he says, dude, you should be a, a comedian. And then I said, I'm 33 years old, man. And, you know, I got a job, I got a family, I got kids. He says, no, you should really open for the band. Oh, okay, so I went up there, did everybody else's material, uh, and then it just bit me, and then it just started one thing after another started happening. I was opening for this band, I was opening for this comic, and then, you know, TV started coming around. So now I just left that job. Over, I didn't even tell them. I just left, you know, and then just started doing this for a living, and it's been great. It's been almost thirty years now. It's twenty-eight years. Wow. Yeah. And. Uh, were you involved in music before you started doing st- uh, stand-up? I was, I was a DJ for many years. Okay. Uh, in clubs, and then I was doing you know the DJ thing with uh, weddings and all that stuff. So, uh, 
and then I played a little guitar. I had a couple of garage bands as a kid. And then now, at this age, I decided to have a band now. So we do a, what, what was rock then is now classic rock. So we're doing a classic rock band now. So don't too old for that stuff, man. You know, because comedy, you go walk in, you go to the mic, you do your half hour, forty five minutes, you get your money, and you leave. Being in a band, you got to carry stuff. <laughs> you know, I'm not twenty. I'm not twenty years old no more, man. So you know, to carry it in the car, take it out of the car, put it in the gig, take it out of the gig, put it back in the car, take it out of the car, put it back in the house. <laughs> Man, I'm having Geritol and Ben Gay and Vix <laughs> at the end of each gig, you know, so it's like, I don't know about this, man, so, but it's cool, it's fun. Oh, it that's fun. awesome. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what made you, uh, as you were starting to do stand-up, what made you decide that you wanted to uh, create a niche for yourself, because that's what you did right. in in MCing? Well, what I wanted to do, and, and as you know, uh, there wasn't a lot of room for Latino comics at, right. when we started. Uh, there was George and Paul, and we had to start doing uh, shows in bars or in uh, fundraisers or some sort. We had to, that's what we had to work out, learn our craft. So when we started, we convinced the clubs that you know there's a market, and when they saw the numbers coming in, then they realized, oh, there is a market. But to do that, somebody had to host it, somebody had to produce the show, somebody had to book the comics, and so that's what I did. And I did it a couple of times, and after that, it just continued to go. And now I've been at the ISOs 20 years doing that. And in, and in the midst of that, there have been comics that have come and gone, there have been comics that have gone to great success, you know. Uh, there was a 19-year-old kid that came and had, was doing cartoon voices, you know, little chubby kid, and, and now he's, traveling worldwide and got million, a series millionaires got a series That's now right. yeah so Gabriel Iglesias yeah, yeah. yes so yeah so there's there's been a number of, of comics that have gone on to to big success and I, you know I'm not saying I'm because of me but no I'm but you get you gave a platform for us to be able to work and have time not a absolutely. couple of minutes but to be able to um, work out the material right. bring it back right and not and not get penalized right absolutely so yeah. yeah, so you know, it's good to see man. Stephen yeah. Steakhouse. And, right, right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there all these um, bars and and ho and uh, restaurants and clubs right. that you really got up in there and and got spots for our community to right. not only uh, hone our craft but to have Latino audiences come right. and feel part of it. Yeah, because they could relate to the comedy now, you know. So. Um, it was, it was good in a sense because, like I said, there was a market. I mean, business-wise, if you're a club owner and you're in the middle of the San Gabriel Valley where you're surrounded by Latinos and, you're, and you don't have any Latinos on your show, something's wrong. So when they realize that, and they, you know, you know us, we, we show up, we, we show up with everybody. It's like a wedding. You invite you and <laughs> 10 other people to come with you. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was cool. It was, uh, it was great. And then celebrities started popping in because we had so many people so celebrity because the rooms were always hot yeah. and are always hot yes and they would be popping in and you know people you never thought would, Roseanne popped in Louis Anderson I mean I'm not dropping names but I'm saying people of that caliber were showing up and what, what are you doing here on a Tuesday they said well we heard this room is hot man yeah. I said yeah it is you know <laughs> so so yeah so we, we would do that man and, and it's it's been great the casinos. The casinos too. Yes, yeah. that was a that was a wonderful room. Yeah, by that the was way. great. Yeah, that was that, that was, was, yeah. that, was yeah. that was the uh, actually in that room was the first time that I saw George Lopez hold the audience hostage for an hour yeah. and just wipe them out. I right. mean, when he was done, everybody needed to yeah, go everybody home. Went home. Yeah, yeah, because it was <laughs> including the comics. It was over. Yeah, it was like I can't follow that. Yeah, that yeah. was he just like. He was relentless. Yeah. I mean, I, I just remember the, uh, it was like bam, 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 like a machine, like a comedy mm -hmm. machine gun. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of what you've brought is that you have brought all these people into the rooms that they come in and they feel loved and they, they get yeah. to do their stuff. So that's the idea. thank you, Rudy. You're welcome. Man. Thank you, Rudy. <laughs> You're welcome. So, what is it about emceeing that you love? Well, uh, emceeing, I don't have to stick to a set. I can uh, work on the crowd. I can uh, talk about topical stuff. Uh, if I'm bombing, I can bring up the next comic, you know? So uh, it, it's just a fun thing to do. It's just because you get to do different stuff every week because if you have the same people coming back, 
You don't want to be doing the same stuff. So now, did you have a, a comedy mentor uh, walking you through emceeing? No, no, no. This I, Gilbert and I were doing these rooms in in the neighborhoods because we couldn't get into the club. So we started doing these rooms, you know, the Black Angus or something, you know. We, we always joke about doing comedy at a boy local soon. Um, but we, that's all, we, we honed our skills. So Gilbert and I would say, well, what do you think that you should do this? I'll do it like this and do it like that. And um, that's how we developed a hosting thing. And uh, I think we would run into different guys like Fraser Smith that have been doing it like at the Laugh Factory and stuff like that, and then compare notes. But other than that, you know, we're just goofy guys, you know. Now you teach stand-up. Right. What is uh, one of the misconceptions you see when uh, people sign up to take your classes? A lot of times what I'll see is somebody who's funny in the street, which is a good thing because some guys are naturally funny. You want to be naturally funny mm -hmm. to be a, a comedian. But they want to bring that to the stage. And it's a different animal when you get on the stage because you're not talking to your boys in the, in the, on the corner. You know, you're talking to an audience. It might be a diverse audience. It might be, you know, whatever. But these people came to be, get entertained. You know, it's not like when you're in the street and go, hey, you, your mama this, and, you know, and you're a little offensive and stuff. So I tell them, there's a technique. This is how you do a joke. There's a formula. There's a premise, a setup, the punchline. Uh, not everything is a cuss word, you know, because when you're doing it in the streets, you can be funny just cussing away. And now you gotta you got to develop a set, and then you got to have stage mechanics. You have to have a personality. You have to be likable. You have to have your own voice. So they're like, yeah, you got to do all that. And that's part of it, man, you know. There's guys that go up there and try to do what they do in the street or at home, and it doesn't translate on stage. Or by the water cooler. Yeah, <laughs> by the water cooler, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't translate on stage. So. And um, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to start doing stand-up? Stay in school. No. Uh, <laughs> no um, you know, if you're funny and you think you can do it, try it. You know, it's a lot of fun. Look, it's, it's a good gig. The business is a little tricky because at the end of the thing, you don't get a gold watch. You know, you don't get a pension. So do this. Be passionate about it. Save your money. Uh, work as much as you can. Get up as much as you can. The more you get up, the better you become. If you do it like once a month and go, well, I think it's I'll not do it. Work. In, I think I'll do it in July again. You know, and then yeah. wonder, how come they're not laughing? Well, you know. Yeah, because it's a muscle. Absolutely. You gotta, you gotta work that muscle every day. Yeah. Every I mean, day. So I tell them get up if it's a wedding, if it's a, if it's at work, you know, if they're, you know, whatever you got, if you have a chance and opportunity to get up, go ahead and do it. What comics have inspired you or or taught you something? Oh well, I, I'm old school, man. I. I I grew up with Richard Pryor, uh, George Carlin, uh, those cats that were, they were a little different than the regular uh, nightclub act. But you know, there's, there's now being in this business so many years, I, I've, I've listened to so many different guys that are pretty clever. You know, uh, Louis Anderson was, he wasn't somebody that I was aware of because of his style. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, but guys like that and. As far as, as learning locally, I toured with George for a while, and George taught me a lot about being on time, dressing correctly, uh, doing your time, don't go over it, respecting the light, respecting your other comics. Can, can you say that again? <laughs> respecting the other comics, respecting the light. Um, because, you know, there, there's, there's a thing in a club. If you have 90 minutes for a show, and you're supposed to do 20, and the next guy has so much, and you do 40, and you're gonna cut this guy's time down, and then maybe even the last guy won't even get up, you know? So, uh, those little things that you gotta learn in the business. So, George taught me a lot. Gilbert Esquivel uh, was the one who was very inspiring, and guys like Larry Omaha, remember Larry? Oh, I love Larry. Yeah, and um, those guys took the time to, to say, no, look, man, you can't, you can't do that. You know, it's, it's like this. And said, Why not? Because, and then they explain it to me, so. So I took all that information and I said, well, let me try this. Let me try doing that to these young comics. And I've gotten young comics, people that are, you know, 16 years old. And I had a, a guy in my class that was uh, 75 years old. 
doing your stand up you you were doing a lot with with Gilbert Esquivel and you brought right. his name up a couple of times who is Gilbert Esquivel Gilbert Esquivel is probably one of the nicest guys in the business you know Gilbert uh, for many years I met Gilbert at a church gig they had hired him somebody hired him somebody hired me and we got to this church I'll make a short story and everybody there had cowboy hats and the big belts and the boots and we thought man this is nobody speaks English here I said, you do your in Spanish? He goes, no, man, do you, do you want to do yours in Spanish? I go, well, you know, whatever works, right? So we flipped the coin. He, he said, you lost, you're up first, dog. So he went up there and he tried his, his best Spanish and they weren't having it. They were nothing. So he says, it's all yours, man. So I went up there and the first thing I said, does anybody speak English? They all raised their hand. Yeah, we speak English. Oh, okay. So then, you know, so we became the best of friends. We recorded a DVD together. He's just a very spirited guy. He's a religious man. Uh, he's just funny. He's just funny, and he's a good man, a good family man. Takes care of clean. His kids clean. Always time. worked clean. Always clean. Always worked clean. And, uh, One of the few. Yeah, and just kills it every time. Mm-hmm. You know, Gil, Gil's, Gil's a bad dude. You know. Yeah. So we've we've become really good friends because we've had so many things in common. You know, uh, family, areas where we lived, uh, history, and so we, you know. You, you get to bond with somebody like that. So I've, all, I've had the pleasure of knowing him for many years. So. What are uh, some good things that you've learned from doing stand-up all these years in, uh, business-wise? Right. And then some bad things you've learned business-wise. <sighs> Let's see. Good question. Um, business-wise, as far as comics are concerned, you have to create your own work. Sometimes you got to go on the road for a long time. You know, not necessarily months, but I mean, sometimes you got to follow the work and they can't be out of town sometimes. And maybe it's not always at home. Um, you can create, you can produce your own shows to make your own money if you want, depending on how hard you want to work. The bad thing about comedy is there are people out there that will take advantage of you. There are promoters and club owners and people that... Uh, if, if you're green and, and they know you're green, you go out there. So let's talk about how you get your money after you... Uh... Well, I got a stick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got a stick. I carry a dog with me. Uh, no, you know, then you know, then some of your own street knowledge comes in. You, oh, and, yes. And you got to talk to somebody. Oh, yes. Because you, know, you go somewhere and they'll go, well, you know, it's raining. Nobody came here, man. And so we didn't make any money, so you're not getting yours. Well, no, I'm getting mine. Because, you know, otherwise I'm, I'm burning up something. So. <laughs> but no, never, never buy that. Um, I'm, I, I would offer to go to the ATM with them. I'm, I'll oh, go yeah. with you to the ATM. Right. I have no problem. Right. Exactly. I'm, I'm getting my money before I get back on that plane. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, or you get your money up front. Yes. And you get there. So when I show up, you give me my money. Well, how do I know? Well, I'm already here, man. You know, I just traveled a thousand miles. What, what am I going to do? Take your money and run? Um, and get, or get half up front yeah. and half when you get there. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. always. Yes. So that you don't come home with nothing in your pocket, you know, especially if that's your living, you know. Yeah. That's how you provide for your family. You can't come back and go, well, um, you know. My favorite used to be when I'd ask people, what's your budget? Oh, we've got a big budget. Yeah, yeah. I said, oh, okay, well, yeah. this is what, you know, we get paid. Oh, yeah. And then you get there and they say, well, I thought that was for everybody. Yeah. Actually, Gilbert and I, that happened to, uh, some guy had asked me if, if I, you know, if I could suggest another comic, and I offered Gilbert, and I said, this is what we get paid, right. we get there, and the guy, after the thing, I said, we're ready for the money, because right. I have no shame about asking for my money, and so he pulls out $500, right. and I said, Okay, where's the other five hundred right, dollars? Right. And he was like, "Oh no, that's it." I said, "Oh no, that's not it. <laughs> no, that is not right, it." Right. And point Gilbert, yeah. his whole face, like hit the blood drained. He right. said, "No, it's okay." I said, "No, it's not okay." Right, right. I said, "You take this. I'll come to your office tomorrow and get mine." Exactly. So, well, and I think I Gilbert did. must have learned from that because I now, did. Gilbert does that now. You know, there'd be guys that don't get paid, and Gilbert's the first one to jump up for No, 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 man. You know, everybody here is going to get paid. Oh, yeah, you can't. And, 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 and the thing was, and I learned from that one because he said it to me, and I wrote it all down. So I had it in a notebook. Right. But what I realized was, no, that's not good enough. When they tell you what it is, you type it up, you send it to them as an invoice, right. 
and then exactly. or or um, a, a little deal memo, so that there's an understanding that when I come in there, this is what I am getting. So there's no confusion. Because we're not taught that as comics, you right. know, and, and I remember it took me three years to get paid as a comic because I was just so, I was just so happy to be on stage. You, right. You're going to give me stage time and I have to buy yeah. two drinks? Right. I have to buy two drinks? I'll give you money. Okay. Yeah, right? <laughs> buy two yeah. drinks. I'll give you money and I'll go up there and work. And then, yeah. So, I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off when no, no, you no, said no. the money and like. <laughs> yeah, no, no, man. That, that is the absolute truth because it, you know, it is a business. You know, and sometimes comics fail to, to realize that. Yes. And then you go in and say, oh, I'll do it. I just want to go up there and be funny and get drunk with power because you got some laughs. And then you walk out of there and you got nothing to eat or drink or bus fare or whatever. You know, it's a business. If you're going to if you're going to do it as a business, that's right. if you're going to do it for fun. Well, that's another story. Right. You know? And you need to go do it somewhere else. Yeah. Right. But go, do it. Yeah, <laughs> right. go somewhere else because yeah. you're messing it yeah, up for us. A bus depot over that's there. right. <laughs> that's right. So, so at what point did you start saying? I should have my name on the marquee or I should, you know, when you started, because it's not just money, but it's also credibility. Right. Well, uh, again, you have to do your own work. And now with social media, uh, comics have it that much easier because they can just spread their, their, their brand and, and be recognized, you know, to where back in the day we would have to take, you know, pictures and articles and, you know. I remember I sent it to the ISIS one time. I faxed the guy my picture, an article that I had in the paper, some local paper. I go, did you get my stuff? He goes, yeah, I got your stuff. Goes, you got to send me all that. Just come by, man. So, um, but I knew when uh, when a club had me as a headliner. I didn't know I was a headliner. I was just working, and I was adding stuff to my to my set. So when I got to forty five to an hour, and they said you can headline, and I thought, okay. Well, now I start making some money, you know, because when you're the opener or the feature, you don't you don't get paid that much. Right. And uh, you know, Arlene was like, oh, "Where's the money, man?" <laughs> so, <laughs> Your but, wife was not yeah, having so, right. comedy. You to go back to work. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you know, so then you go to places like like Vegas, and Vegas will put your name up there. They won't pay you that much, but you know, you get the uh, accolades. Yeah, you get that. You, know, you, you get, get the satisfaction to, of having you get to take a picture and say, right. my name is on the marquee Up in, in Vegas. Right. Yeah. How much did you make? I made six dollars. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah, yeah that's that's, that's stand up. So how did you get into uh, the Ice House? Because you've had a wonderful uh, partnership with them. Right. I mean, right. they're not doing you a favor. You you have been consistent in bringing in an audience for Correct. 20 years. Right. Well, like I said, when we started doing stuff, there wasn't a venue for Latino comedy. A lot of Latino comics, they're coming from all over, man. New York, Luke Torres was you know, coming from Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona. A lot of people from the Southwest, East Coast were coming. Raul Martinez. Raul Martinez. Yes. I, I wonder what happened to Raul. So when I went and spoke with uh, Sean Sullivan, who was the GM over at the Ice House, we were having lunch, and I go, hey, man, you know, we need a Latino night. And I hated to do it like that because it just seemed like it was just pigeonhole for Latinos. He goes, well, we'll try it. He says, well, I'll give you 30 days, man. I said, well, dude, you don't understand. We are surrounded here. This is like the Alamo, dude. I said, you're surrounded by Latinos in the San Gabriel Valley. You need to give them an outlet, uh, a venue to come to. So he says, okay, let's try it. So we tried it, and 30 days turned into 20 years. So in those 20 years, we have proven to the fact that there's a market for Latinos, and not only Latinos. We changed the name from Latino Night to the Wednesday uh, Night Live because now I'm not just booking Latin comics. I'm booking everybody of every color, every creed, every race, you know. Um, and you're and, wonderful that way. Well, thank you. I mean, even even with Latino Night, you you were wonderful. You would bring Sherry Shepard into the room. I mean, yeah. you brought in a lot of non-Latinos into right, the room. Right, absolutely. Because every, mm -hmm. I mean, funny's funny, man. You know, funny is funny, and it doesn't matter. What, I have a picture in my office of comics standing outside the ice house, and it's uh, I won't name the comics, but there's an African American, there's an American Indian, Mexican, there's a gay man, there's a black man. There's a white com comic, and nobody looks at the picture and says, hey, there's a black man, there's a white guy. Nobody says it. They just say, there's a bunch of comics. And that's the beauty of comedy, because none of that matters. 
So when they said, well, we got to keep it Latino night, I said, well, no, first of all, people are going to think it's in Spanish, you know, and none of us speak Spanish well. And, and secondly, you're just, you're just giving us just a small radius of people. So let's open that up. And so we did, and it's been successful, you know. You don't do 20 years without it being good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they wanted to, to uh, say, well, maybe we, sh we shouldn't let it run that long. And then we, we were trying to stop it at 16, and people were like, no, man, you got to keep doing it. And we had people like George come in and Russell Peters and Arsenio showed up. They said, we want to keep this going. So I thought, where do you guys come from? You know, so it was, it was a good support. Yes. So, what are some of the good things that you've gotten out of stand-up that, that kind of anchors you? Well, you know, uh, I've been fortunate enough to use stand-up as a vehicle to either provide funds for a charity or um, do some good with it. Not just, hey, come see me and let me tell jokes and you pay me money. I've been able to take this and go, look, Lydia, we're doing this thing for this charity over here. Or uh, this person needs some money. Or, let's do a fundraiser. Let's, uh, let's put on a show and get this money and give it to these people because they, they can't pay their rent or they, you know, they're going to lose their house or hospital bills. I was just going to say that. Yeah, medical. Hospital. A lot of comics, the, the bad thing about comedy, like you started off, there is no 401k, there is right. no um, health benefits. Right. You're self employed, you got to figure it out. And so many comics that we've had in the circle have died from yeah. uh, cancer and needed um, financial help. Right. And, you know, it, it, and it also comes back to me because a few years ago, my wife was very sick uh, with the rheumatoid arthritis and the medical bills were crazy, you know. And uh, I talked to a few guys or and some, some of the guys took it upon themselves to to raise some money to do a GoFundMe thing. And, you know, Latinos, we don't we want to work for our money and not necessarily, hey, man, give me money. We never heard of GoFundMe or anything. Paul Rodriguez says we're comics. Uh, if one falls, we all come running, and they did, and mm. it, it was a beautiful thing. Mm. That's awesome, you know? awesome. But that's that's the power of community, right? Yeah, yeah. They they all showed up and you know taking turns, and I'll host for you. Don't worry, man. Stay home and stuff. And it was it was great, you know. And uh, so that's one of the more beautiful things that have happened out of, out of comedy. And and uh, you know we do a toy drive. My wife and I and my, my kids now, and my grandkids now, put everybody to work. Uh, we started when I started in 91. And we started doing these comedy shows and raising toys to underprivileged kids in the neighborhood. Well, this thing's just blown up, man. I mean, it's, we're going on 28 years this year. Wow. And we and now we get involved with uh, Pat Prescott and, mm -hmm. and The Wave and Talia Trigueros. And uh, they've come through. And then we've got now people sponsoring the show. So now we're only, not only sending toys, we're sending money to these, uh, to these charities or children's hospital and uh, shelters and stuff like that. So now it's become a big and business. And do you have a, a 5013? Yes. So, yeah. um, so we have, we'll, we'll put the link below, or the information below, so you can uh, donate if you feel the need. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What is um, one of your most favorite memories of doing stand-up? Hmm. Let's see now. What could happen? Uh, I think, I think when I did the, the Coliseum, they told me it was a car show. And they told me some guy named Ice Cube was gonna be there. I had no idea who he was. And I, and I do this in my act. And um, Ice Cube brought 50,000 people to the Coliseum. And I, I had just done like maybe, I don't know, the uh, Black Angus and the comedy in front of 30, <laughs> 30 people. And I get there and I said, well, where's the car show? No, this is it, man. You're next. Next what? He says, you're next. You go up and then we're going to bring out Ice Cube. Who's that? You, you, you don't know who he is? No, I have no idea. So I go backstage and I forget his name's Ice Cube and I call him Ice Cream. <laughs> I call him Ice Cream and he gets mad at me. And he, who are you, man? I <laughs> so I go up there and there's the Coliseum, man, it's huge. So I went out there and I, I figured if I make half of them laugh, fine. So I had a, I had a decent set and stuff. And, and so uh, he came up and said, you know, you've done good, dog. And I was like, okay. And uh, 
that was probably one of the highlights, you know. And then um, meeting Carlos Santana was the other one. And I wasn't working or nothing like that. I just happened to be backstage uh, with a friend of mine, and Carlos was there. And that, to me, he was bigger than life to me, man. So uh, I get, I never been starstruck, but I stuttered like crazy, man. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> But that was that was one of the cool. Oh, things. that is awesome! Yeah. I, I love I love good stories. I yeah. love to hear good. And he was good to you. Yes, he was very nice. We yeah. loved that. That yeah. that yeah. makes the difference. Very nice. Yeah. Yes, you know, and, there, and there's guys that you meet that are huge stars, and I think the bigger they are, the nicer they are, because there's sometimes you get a, 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 what I call a false positive with some comics that they do a couple of things. They do a TV show. And the next thing they're walking around like, you know, you can't talk to me, man, you know. I was just with you the other day, man, cleaning up your backyard. <laughs> Dude, what, what are you talking about? So, you know, they forget. They forget. They you know? forget. So you loved Santana. Now, what about Cheech Marin? Oh, Cheech Marin. Are we, uh, do you remember the Latino Laugh Festival? Of, Absolutely. It was in San Antonio. Yes. They had every celebrity, every Latino celebrity, Olmos and everybody else was there. So Cheech was one of the hosts. And, and Daisy Fuentes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but Cheech... One of the original MTV yeah, VJs. Yeah. Yes. And uh, Cheech Marine was there and he was a host and he came up to us, the comics that were there, and just said, hey guys, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. We were stunned. You know, this is Cheech Marine, man. You know, 20 years, no, 25 years. I'll take it back. 20 years past. I do a gig for an art show that he's uh, he's doing he's a, a wonderful a, artist. Right. And, he, and he's supporting Latino artists. And he opened up this museum in Riverside. So he said, we want you to host this thing for Cheech Marie. And I was like, oh, my God. you know. So I walk up to him. And why would he remember me? Right? So I go, Cheech, I worked with you at the Latino uh, Laugh Fest. He goes, yeah. Moreno, right? Rudy Moreno? Said, Somebody fed him some notes. <laughs> I don't even remember my name. you know. Just the nicest guy in the world. you know, And the class act. Yes. You know? And uh, it was nice to see that he supported. Um, he's giving back. Yeah, he's giving back he's giving to Latino back. artists. And that's one of the things I remember you used to always tell us, you got to support the home team, support your Latino team. It's not going to happen unless we make it happen. That's right. You know, so if you have a chance to go and support a play, a comedy show, uh, a, a group, uh, you know, a TV show, whatever it is, do it. And yes. I've always taken that advice to heart, thanks to you. And... I've done it. You well, know. you also, I mean, you have always supported, you know, that's that's the beauty of who you are, is, is that you have always been a support to people. When uh, we were doing uh, the Hot and Spicy Mamitas, um, you were the first to give us um, a stage to, to yeah. do our show. First of all, five Latina women, nobody wanted us. No, no, it was <laughs> nobody great show. wanted us. It was, it was but but show. the truth was, nobody wanted us. And so to to be able to to play rooms that you were hosting and you were producing in mm. helped us, you know, so that when we did start playing the comedy store and the and the Laugh Factory and the Ice House and the Improv, right. we were able to uh, bring in men, you know, mm -hmm. like to have. What was so funny is. We would have one. We would figure out who the MC was going to be for that night, and if they took too long on stage, yeah. the audience turned on them because right, right, like right, we right. don't want to see you. We want the <laughs> mamitas. Right, right. right so right. you were one of the first people, if not the first person, to give us that opportunity. Right. You know, and I just think, you know, as Latinos in the business, it is our responsibility to help everybody. Absolutely. You know. Uh, no, well, not everybody. Let me take that. I ain't helping everybody. <laughs> but uh, to help people who really have the talent, have the the drive, and are good. You right. know, that, that you want to champion young people. You want to champion people who They're just passionate. need, they just need the door to be open. Right, right. That's what I tell young comics. You got to be, you have to be passionate about this. It's not... It's not a thing to go show off to your friends. And right? responsible. Absol absolutely. You have, you have to, to be responsible. Yeah. If someone gives you the opportunity, you yeah. have to not make them out to be, you know, bad. Like, ah, right. oh, I shouldn't have done this, you know, because uh, don't give them regrets. Right. Why did I help this person? Right, right. They just right. burned me. And, and I always tell young comics, John Wooden was a, a coach at UCLA. 
he said something that's always stuck with me. He says, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. And I tell my students this because, like any job, you have to prepare yourself, man. You have to have your, your, your stuff ready so when, when opportunity knocks and you're there, you're ready to go. It's not like, oh, well, can I have a, two more days before I go? No. I want you here now, you know? Work ethic. Work ethic, yes. Yeah. So I, it was funny. One time, George Lopez had a show called Lopez Tonight, a uh, talk show. Um, not a lot of guys were on that show, the comics. There's more celebrity and stuff. But he called one day his, his people called and said, George wants you here tomorrow, 5 o'clock. Well, tomorrow for what? You want me to sweep? What do you mean? You know, <laughs> so, so, you know, so he says, no, he wants you to come and do a set, five-minute set. So I had been doing it enough years to know I have five minutes. So when I got there, I did the five minutes. But it was just one of those examples of be ready. Right. You know, be ready. If you're an actor, you know, take acting lessons. It's okay you've been on a TV show already or you've done it. Keep your chops, you know. Keep, keep prepared. Be prepared every time. What would you like to do in the next five years? Rob a bank. No, uh, <laughs> I would, He's kidding. kidding. He's kidding, kidding, kidding people. Comedy. Um, <laughs> I would like, I think I would like to produce shows because I'm at, I'm going to do the age now and the, the time where, you know, some of these things, like I don't go on a road anymore because uh, it's just tiring for me, you know. Uh, what do you want to produce? I want comedy shows or big, big shows, music and comedy. Okay. Um, and maybe at some point even consider doing, uh, selling it to television or something. Uh, I don't know all the ropes behind that, but I could learn it. I can talk to you. Okay, talk to me, girl. <laughs> I know, see, th there's things that you would know that I would love to learn from you. And uh, because those are things that I think of, because, you know, I don't know about doing this stand-up any more than 30 years, man. It's, I mean, I'm sure I can continue doing it. People have been doing it for years and years, but, uh, you know. I hear you. I hear you. It's a little bit, you know, you got to go to Utah again. Utah, okay. <laughs> I went to Utah with Ludo once, at Ludo and Johnny Sanchez. Ludo Vica. Yeah, and Ludo Vica. Sanchez. Oh, God, we're talking about insane. <laughs> That's another story. That's another show. What would you like your legacy to be as a comic? Oh, as a comic? Yes. Uh, that... I helped a lot of people in their careers, and I've also used comedy to help others. Uh, that's pretty much it. If you can do that, you can use it as a vehicle to help other people, why not? Well, I am so happy that I got to uh, bring you to the table. This was so Thank much you. fun. Thank you so I love much. you so much, Rudy. Likewise. I'm so so grateful to you for everything. So thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Yes, I'm thank you. To be here. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Acting Smarter Now podcast. If uh, you enjoyed the interview, please leave us comments and share with friends so that Rudy's memory can live on and on and on. If you need some help with self-care, check out this next interview I did.